Hi, my name is Milan and in this video we are continuing our story about Keycloak and I'll show you how to integrate Keycloak as an external identity provider with an existing .NET application. I also prepared some bonus ideas inside of this video that I think you'll enjoy, so let's dive in. If you're not familiar with Keycloak, it's an open source identity provider, it's completely free to use, and it's compatible with both OAuth and OpenID. And the good part is that integrating Keycloak with a .NET application is relatively straightforward. You're going to see this when we jump into the code, but let's first walk through our agenda for this video. We're going to start by quickly setting up our Keycloak realm and client. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, I already covered this in my initial video about Keycloak, so if you get confused at any point, I recommend that you watch that video first. Then we're going to configure authentication using JSON Web Tokens inside of a .NET API, and we're going to do a deep dive into how the authentication flow looks like when we are using an external identity provider. You will see that there are some interesting aspects when it comes to using Keycloak that only become visible when we introduce distributed tracing. Also, here's a quick recap of what we already covered in the Keycloak series. In the first video, we focused on just setting up Keycloak, authenticating with the Keycloak identity provider and obtaining an access token. In this video, we're going to cover the second part of this diagram, which is actually sending an access token to our backend API, which is going to validate the access token with Keycloak, and if this is a valid access token, it's going to return an API response. In order to implement this in a .NET application, we can leverage the existing support for authentication. We already have authentication and authorization services. The only additional thing that we are going to need is to introduce support for JSON Web Tokens, and this is what the basic setup looks like we're going to tweak the token validation parameters slightly and I'll show you what are the correct values to set for the issuer, audience, and some other options that we will need to configure in order to integrate correctly with Keycloak. So this is the .NET application that I'm going to use for implementing authentication with Keycloak. And right now we don't have a lot of things going on here. We have our Swagger setup, I'm exposing the Swagger UI, and I'm also adding the authentication and authorization middleware. You will also notice I have some proxy project inside of my solution. We're going to talk about this a bit later, and let's also take a look at the Docker Compose setup. So what I have enabled right now is just my API project, the Keycloak auth API, and I'm also running Keycloak inside of a Docker container. I'm exposing my help checks, I'm configuring the administrator username and password. I'm also adding a volume so that we can persist the Keycloak data when we restart the container. This is the Keycloak image that I'm using, so quay.io, Keycloak, Keycloak. I'm also specifying the start development command to make the startup a bit faster, and we are going to discuss the other things that I have commented out here a bit later into the video. For now, let's start the application which is going to run our API and Keycloak, and then let's create our Keycloak realm and the client that we are going to need. If I open up Docker Compose, you can see that my two services are up and running. So I'm going to navigate to the Keycloak URL, and I'm going to land on the login screen where I'm going to specify the administrator username and password. If we sign in, we're going to land on the default realm, which is the master realm. I'm going to create a new one, and I'm going to give it a name of Keycloak of demo. Let's create our realm. Then I'm going to head into realm settings, go to the login tab, and I'm going to enable user registration. And I'm also going to create my client. So let's click create client. I'm going to choose open ID connect. The client ID is going to be public client because this is going to be the public client for my application. And I'm also going to enable the implicit flow next to the standard and direct access grants. So let's click next. I'm going to set up the redirect URIs to point to localhost 5001, where my API project is going to be running, and I'm also going to set the same value in the web origins. So let's click save, and this is my public client. And this takes care of the setup that I need for the time being inside of Keycloak. Now let's go back to our application. In order to check if our authentication is working as expected, we're going to need an API endpoint, and I'm going to create a simple endpoint called users slash me. And this endpoint is just going to return the claims for the current user. I'm going to get them by injecting a claims principle. And in the body of my endpoint, I'm going to say return. I'm going to access the claims collection. And then I will say to dictionary. For the key, we're going to use the claim type. And then I will provide the claim value as the value selector. 
I'm also going to say require authorization so that only an authenticated user can access this endpoint. Now, let me show you something that I prepared ahead of time in the add swagger gen with auth extension method. And here I'm additionally configuring my swagger document to implement authentication with Keycloak using the implicit OAuth flow. You can configure what are the scopes that you want to request from the Keycloak identity provider. The important thing that we will need to set is the authorization URL in our application settings. I'm going to show you what the correct value is in just a moment. I'm also adding a security requirement, which is going to use the value that we get back from Keycloak as the bearer token that we send to our API when issuing API requests. Now let's focus on the authorization URL. This is actually a well-known value and here's what I'm going to specify inside of my application settings. I prepared a Keycloak section with an authorization URL value and this is the URL that I'm going to specify. So HTTP localhost 1880, which is where my Keycloak instance is exposed on my local machine. Then I need to specify realms and provide the concrete name for my realm, which is Keycloak of demo. And then I need to specify protocol, open ID connect, and off, which is the authorization URL. So most of these parameters are standard. The only thing that's going to change is going to be the name of your realm and possibly the address where Keycloak is exposed. So let's go ahead and start the application and let's see how this is behaving. If we open up the Swagger UI and click on the authorize button, you will see our Keycloak security definition. It's using OAuth2 and the implicit flow. The authorization URL is pointing to the value that we configured in our application settings, but this is actually where our Keycloak instance is exposed. So I'm going to specify the name of the client, which is public client, and we created this at the start of the video. And I'm going to select both of my scopes and click authorize. And this is going to redirect me to the Keycloak user interface, where I can proceed to provide a username and password and authenticate with Keycloak. Now, if I don't have a username and password, I can click register and let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to create a user called off at demo.com. Going to specify some password and confirm this password. I'm going to use the same value for the email and then let's use demo and demo for the first and last name. So let's click register and you will see that we are redirected back to our Swagger UI and we are now successfully authenticated with Keycloak. Now I can close this down and I can go ahead and send a GET request to this endpoint. So let's click try it out and execute. And you can see that our request fails because we don't have an authentication scheme configured. But if you take a look at the request here, you can see that a bearer token is present. So if I go ahead and select the entire access token and I head over to jwt.io, we can take a look at what we have inside of this access token. So you will see the subject ID, the email of our current user, if the email is verified or not. But what I want to focus on is the issuer, which is this value here, and the audience, which is this value here. This is what we will have to provide inside of our application settings when we want to configure authentication using JSON web tokens. So let's go back to our code and introduce support for this. We're going to need an additional NuGet package. So let's look for JWT bearer, and I'm going to install Microsoft ASP.NET Core Authentication JWT bearer. Inside of our program file, I already added the calls to add authorization and add authentication. Now let's go ahead and introduce a few more method calls. So I'm going to specify my authentication scheme here by using JWT bearer defaults and specifying the bearer authentication scheme. Then I'm going to say add JWT bearer and I want to configure the JWT bearer options. I'm going to say require HTTPS metadata should be false. I'm going to set the audience to the respective value that I have inside of my application settings. And this is going to be authentication audience. Then we're going to set this interesting value and I'm going to explain what it is. It's called metadata address. So let's provide the value that we have inside of authentication metadata address. I'm also going to specify some value in the token validation parameters. And what I want to configure is the valid issuer. So I'm going to say valid issuer, and I'm going to assign the value from my application settings by saying builder configuration authentication, and we are going to use the valid issuer. So this is our authentication setup. Now you probably have an idea 
of what the value should be here and here. And if you're not sure, these are going to be the same values that are inside of our JSON web token. So let's go ahead and use this value for the issuer and then account for the audience. I'm going to set these values inside of my application settings development JSON. So this is my valid issuer and then the audience is account. And then what about the metadata address? This is another well-known URI and the correct value here is going to be HTTP. I will have to specify key cloak 8080 and this is actually the internal address of the key cloak service in the Docker Compose network. So this is why I'm using key cloak instead of localhost. Then we have to specify realms and then the name of our realm. And you can see how this is following a similar format as above. And then I need to specify well-known and then I need to say open ID configuration. So this is the correct value for the metadata address. But what does this value contain? Well, let's go into Postman and send a request to Keycloak and let's find out. If we go ahead and send a metadata request to Keycloak, this is what we are going to get back. So let me expand on the response and you can see that this contains a lot of useful information about our Keycloak realm. So here is the issuer value. Then we have our authorization endpoint, our token endpoint, and so on. But what this also contains is an address to obtain the certificates that can be used to validate our JSON web token signature. If I go ahead and send a request to this URL, so let's go ahead and copy this value. Here is what we are going to get back. And this is what our application is going to obtain from Keycloak in order to validate the JSON web token. So if I go back to Visual Studio, and restart my application. And I send the same request from Swagger, assuming that my access token hasn't expired, I should see a response back from my API. And you can see that we get back a 200 OK response. The response contains all of the claims that are present on our JSON web token. So our authentication with Keycloak is working as expected. But now I want to show you a few more things so that we can go under the hood of the authentication flow. So what I'm going to do is to add some NuGet packages for OpenTelemetry. Then I will go into my Docker Compose setup and I'm going to uncomment the Jaeger Docker image, which is going to run the Jaeger tracing image when we start our application. And this is going to collect my OpenTelemetry traces and allow me to visualize how the requests flow through my application. I'm also setting an environment variable that's going to point to the OpenTelemetry exporter endpoint. And this is going to point to my Jaeger instance. I also need to set up OpenTelemetry services inside of my web API. So this is the code that I will need to add. I already covered this in depth in my OpenTelemetry video with Jaeger. So you can go ahead and watch that. I'm just going to add this code, which is going to configure tracing with OpenTelemetry. And then let's start our application. So our application is up and running again. I'm going to first authorize using the public client. We are already logged in to Keycloak, so the authentication happens immediately. And then let's go ahead and send a few requests. You can see that we are getting 200 OK. And then let's navigate to the Swagger UI, where I already have some traces for the Keycloak of API service. And the particular trace that I'm looking for is this one here. And this is because I want to show you something. So you can see that the request to the users slash me endpoint contains three spans. And if we drill down, the second span here is an external GET request, which is sent to our Keycloak service. And this is actually targeting the metadata address that we configured in our application settings. Let me also expand this so that you can see this properly on the screen. And here is the actual address. So this first request is going to obtain the required metadata. And then we have a second request, which is going to access the required certificates in order to validate the JSON web token. But if we take a look at the traces after this one, you will notice that there is just one span. This is because the metadata and the certificates are going to be cached after the first successful request. And let me also show you what happens when we introduce a proxy into the mix. I configured a YARP instance that's just going to proxy requests to my API instance. And it's also configured to use JSON web token authentication, all the parameters point to the same Keycloak instance. So now we have two web APIs that are both authenticating with Keycloak. I also configured OpenTelemetry and the required middleware. The only thing that's left is to uncomment this in my Docker Compose setup and also in the override file. And now when I start the application, it should also start my reverse proxy. So I can close all of this down. 
and just leave the two program files if we need them by chance. But if I open up Docker desktop, you can see that my proxy is up and running and it's exposed on the port 6000 and 6001. So I'll open up Swagger where I already have a GET request pointing to the 6001 port and the address is user slash me that is just going to be proxied to the actual API instance. Now I will need to provide a bearer token in the authorization header and I'm going to use the access token that I obtained by authenticating with Keycloak. So if I hit send, we should get back a response after a few moments and you can see that the response contains our dictionary with the claim types and claim values. But what I really wanted to show you is how authentication behaves when we introduce a proxy. So here is the request that we sent to our proxy and if I open up this particular trace, you can see that it's also going to request the metadata from Keycloak. Then it's going to send another request for the certificates. And after it validates the access token, then it's going to proxy the actual request to the API instance. The API instance is going to do the same. It's going to access the metadata, the certificate, and then it's going to return a response. If I send the same request again from Postman, we're going to get the response back. But if I take a look at the traces, you can see that this time we only have our request to the proxy, which is this span here. Then we have a request which is being proxied to the API instance. And this is the request hitting the API instance, which is going to give us back the response. So this time the OAuth metadata and the certificates are cached and there is no need to reach out to Keycloak to obtain them. But what I wanted to highlight is that even though you may have a reverse proxy or an API gateway, you still want to have authentication configured on both the proxy and your downstream services because your downstream services will need to know who is the current user because they may want to grab the user's identifier or they also want to enforce some authorization policies that are specific to that service. And this is all there is to it. We are just setting up JSON Web Token authentication and we are providing the valid issuer, the audience and the metadata address so that our service can reach out to Keycloak and obtain the required information in order to correctly validate the JSON Web Token. I hope you got value out of this video. If you want to learn more about distributed tracing, then you should watch this video next. Check out my clean architecture and modular monolith courses to sharpen your skills and until next time stay awesome.